Yeah, so Markus, thank you very much for the invitation and also for the kind introduction. And as Markus already mentioned, uh, in the first part I would like to briefly share my opinion uh, on translation, on translating academic science into industrial application with you. And in the second part uh, I would like to uh, uh, introduce you to the Lead Discovery Center, which is one of these uh, professional uh, translational research centers. So this is just a cartoon to show, I guess most of you know, that uh, if you go really from, from bench to patients, meaning from identifying targets where it's uh, uh, modulation of these targets uh, could be beneficial for patients, uh, that's a very long and winding road, so it <coughs> takes roughly 12, sometimes even 15 years uh, from the uh, discovery here, from a potential, from a, from a putative target until a drug reaches the market, reaches the patient. And uh, there are also costs associated and so on. What I would like to emphasize is that there are different phases where you need different skills, different attitudes, different people, and all over the whole uh, value chain, how it is called, you need various uh, disciplines and expertise. Uh, particularly in the, the early part, you need biologists, chemists, pharmacologists, clinicians, and so on. So drug discovery is a teamwork and you need different disciplines. So the, the, the very old days, where one person identified the drug, so that's completely over. And I would like to more specialize here on, on the early drug discovery phase. So uh, in my definition, so this is the, the, the discovery phase up to what I call in vivo proof of concept, which means that modulating of the, ter of the target in a therapeutic animal model has been shown uh, to be beneficial for a certain readout. And the compound series here identified that are tested in these in vivo models, they also have to be patentable and have to be further optimizable because that's the, the uh, infliction point where you demonstrate the, the potency and efficacy in animals and then the compounds have to be made fit for application in human. So this is still another uh, two years endeavor. And in the recent years, 10, 15 years, there has been a considerable structural change in this early phase in early drug discovery. And the reason is that pharmaceutical industry is cutting resources, uh, so Markus mentioned, uh, the research site of Novartis was closed, so I moved to Dortmund uh, and almost yeah, every quarter of a year you read uh, another research, uh, research site closed uh, in the States, in Japan, in the UK. Um, and industry is building more and more on externalization and, and open innovation, how it's called. They, they themselves are opening up and share some of the infrastructure. So things that uh, wouldn't have been possible 10 years ago, like sharing compounds, compound libraries, that's now coming en vogue. And industry is rediscovering academia as a rich source of innovation, also in the life science center. So that's one part. And uh, on the other part uh, of the universe, uh, the academic centers, more and more are pushing into this early drug discovery. So they are interested in, is it possible to apply uh, the basic research results? Can I participate in identifying and discovering uh, new drugs? But there are also some limitations and, and downsides, but that's not what I would like to discuss uh, today. It's more about there are new models, new paradigms required to uh, adapt and, and to uh, counteract to this structural change here. And if we now think towards a future paradigm, a future solution of the early drug discovery, 
uh, aspect. There was a, a paper I like very much uh, already in, in 2002 where it says there are two types of innovation. So one is the breakthrough, they call it quantum leap innovation and the incremental innovation. So just as an example, uh, the discovery of the first penicillin by Ian Fleming. So this would be uh, qualifying as a breakthrough innovation, as a quantum leap innovation. And the further development then of this first penicillin into penicillin V, which was the first penicillin that could be orally administered. So this one could not be orally uh, administered. This was then uh, an incremental innovation in industry. So both types are needed if the business is to survive. So I'm, I'm not concerned about the business, I'm more concerned about the patients. So if we need new therapies, and we sure we need, we need both types of this innovation. But uh, what I find so, um, so, so nice is that they already concluded that both types cannot be successful under the same roof because there is a different culture there is uh, different skill sets, different incentives, uh, and what I'm talking about is academia and, and industry. So there is a huge cultural difference, and also industry is now opening up. It will take many years uh, for this structural change in culture now uh, that a direct collaboration is easily possible. And Incremental innovation and this robustness uh, that's uh, essential in, in industry, in application, in development. Breakthrough innovation cannot be planned and managed, and I like this quote here. So if you plan breakthrough innovation, you will not succeed with breakthroughs. At best, you can get uh, these incremental uh, innovations. And if they are planned and managed, uh, and you need uh, the, the industrial setting, so if you would transfer this to the academic world, uh, then it's, for me, it's pretty clear that uh, the, the um, inventory innovation uh, possibilities and environment of the academic field will be just killed by these industrial settings, criteria, and regulation. So, Again, thinking about the future, I've listed here a few questions. Uh, and I think the first two can be quite easily answered. In my opinion, the breakthrough innovation, they come, most of them come from academia. And this should continue. So basic research should be done in academia. The third question for me is, is much more difficult to answer. So who should take the responsibility then for translating these academic research results into application. I think academia cannot do it on its own, alone. Uh, should it be done by industry? I would question this. So is society responsible? Because I'm talking about responsibility, which also has an impact then on the funding, which I don't want to discuss today. But uh, the responsibility, of course, includes also uh, who gives the money for this uh, translation. And uh, so, again, further question, who should do then actually do the experiments in translation? Should it be academia? Uh, then I would uh, ask, is academia really prepared and equipped? So I mentioned already before uh, that more and more academic centers are pushing into these early drug discoveries. Uh, but in my opinion, uh, most of them are neither prepared nor equipped. And what the benefit of academia is, that uh, in particular in the early drug discovery phase, they have a huge impact here. So this is the, the whole drug discovery and development uh, value chain. And I would claim that in all the different phases, academia can contribute and industry can contribute. But particularly in this early phase, it's much more uh, academia can do here. But, and this was already mentioned uh, partly, um, the strengths of academia are not integrated in industrial research and development. So that's really a different culture, a different world. And most of the innovation 
uh, target hypothesis and so on, uh, they happen in academia, but they are not even evaluated for further translation. Uh, so plenty of innovative basic research results are not really translated. So how can we solve this? Now coming back to who should do this and who should be responsible. Um, in principle, one could envisage that in academic organizations, uh, one could establish uh, a small biotech company taking care. So to transfer uh, the, the, um, the pharma regulations and so on into the ac academic world. And my in my opinion, this would be completely detrimental. Uh, and therefore, I would say this should not happen because uh, in academia should not be industrialized because it would kill this uh, inventive environment. Should industry be heavily working in basic research? And again, I would say no, because it's a waste of money. And, and that's one of the reasons for this structural change I mentioned in the early part of drug discovery, because many big pharma companies, they had active basic research within their organizations and they failed more or less because the companies tried to plan and manage this basic research and this failed. So it's pretty clear for me that industry should not compete with academia, it should be supporting academic basic research. And so the Mm -hmm. culture, which is sort of a bridge between yep. the academic and the big pharma. Mm -hmm. which is sort of your, it, it does sort of on your pipeline the part between the target implication and then the later phases. Mm -hmm. Is that, what's your opinion on that? Is that just less prevalent in the European landscape due to this venture capital or? Yeah, so, so in Europe uh, that's much less developed and existing. So there is, so I would say even in, in life sense there is no venture capital in Europe available for this type. Of course, I know that there are companies founded by the companies and so on, but compared to, to the US, uh, it's, it's really not, not, not existing. Then you need the, the right type of people to do this. And if uh, excellent basic researchers are always qualified to run a company, I would question. And then, of course, in, in, in some examples, this, this is a, a very valid option and way to go and can be successful. Uh, but there are other things. I, mean, I, I, I could now speak quite, quite uh, lengthy about this. Um, I, th I, I personally believe in, the, in a portfolio approach. So having, having several projects mm -hmm. and one will make it. In this biotech approach, you usually have one or two in a company. And if it doesn't make it, that's the end of the company. Yeah, the people, yeah. you know, that, that's fine. In the American context, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the company is there. Yeah, because they, they are then reshuffled, that's okay. But, yeah. but in Europe, this system is not really existing. The culture of failure is not one the European No, no, not at all, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's another argument here, yeah. yeah. But it certainly is one of the options, yeah. I don't know but we're talking about the relative efficiencies of the different... But still, uh, I would... are arguing for an importing yeah. a special yeah. aspect into mm -hmm. the academic perspective mm -hmm. framework, right? Have you thought about contrasting that to what the American version is, which is... I mean, maybe you say it's impossible in the European culture, that's one way to think about it, but... Um, um, have you have thought about the comparison? You... I, I didn't get everything. So, so you mean the comparison between? Like, because you're arguing yeah. for efficiency, creating more efficient yeah. Yeah. pipeline, right? Yeah. And so I'm just saying, it seems like you're advocating for a model in which there's sort of a quasi-academic mid-pipeline phase. Yeah. Yeah. Have you thought about, from a standpoint of efficiency or effectiveness, that model versus the American startup culture, which is definitely near academic centers but not under an academic? Uh, so my, my argument would be, and, and uh, I've shown you one uh, literature reference where we also discussed this a little bit. So even, even in the US, I would say that biotech has not really delivered, has not really filled the gap. So it's one option to do this, to, uh, one way to go, 
and certainly one right way to go, but it's not solving really sol solving really the, the 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 problem of translation or of lack of translation. So I think there are still also in the U.S. many good basic research results just lying around and not followed on. So that's my personal opinion. Just maybe if I can add one, one thing. I mean, biotech doesn't have an easy life in the US. You see, I, I, I mean, raising, depending on the stage and sort of the background of the founders, um, really from scratch is really difficult in the US as well. Um, what's true in, in all dimensions of PC and certainly in biotech is that, uh, that the amounts involved are obviously completely different, right, in the, in the US and Europe. And I think that might be actually interesting also for you, Peter, to look at the role that mm -hmm. your institution or, yeah. or general translation research institutes could play in cooperation with a startup team from an academic institution. Yes, right? certainly. We, we will certainly have lots of teams that might be interested in this that will certainly not have mm -hmm. the resources on, on the chemistry side early on mm -hmm. uh, and will not get the VC funding actually to do this in-house, yeah. right? And that might be an interesting combination. Of yeah, you're completely right. And in fact, we, we have already one collaboration with such a biotech company and, and we are discussing the, the next one just next, next month. Uh, but coming back also to, to, to this uh, biotech versus uh, what I will show you in a, in a minute in more detail is, um, as Marco said, so as a biotech, you don't have an easy life. Yeah? You have the investors sitting here uh, and you have to deliver. Uh, in this model I will show you, there is also a huge motivation to deliver, but to deliver quality and not so much uh, to, to care on, on, on time, mm -hmm. yeah? but more on quality. And the investor, of course, wants quality, but within a certain time frame. And if the time frame is, is over, um, again, the company may not exist anymore. And, and this is completely different here because uh, what I would like to propagate the ideal situation is yeah, to really not saying I have to, to um, uh, abolish a weakness somewhere, yeah, but I would like to combine the strength of both worlds. Yeah? So the ideal scenario would be uh, one huge house, yeah? so where, where academia is, is uh, taking care about the very first uh, part here, but always participating up to the market here and industry as well, yeah? and that both worlds use their strength, their expertise, combine those for the benefit of the patient. So that would be the ideal world. Yeah? And I guess, yeah, so that's a vision and <laughs> um, may stay a vision. But I can show you that, that in, 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 in some ways we have a little bit achieved in, in going in this direction. And what uh, is an important component then is that the risks and the rewards have to be shared here. So not only the work, uh, also the, the rewards. So that would be the ideal world. And I mentioned already, so, and, and I have seen this, uh, um, uh, also my own experience, uh, academia and industry are two different worlds, yeah? Particularly the, the culture and the incentive system and so on. And how I think we can, we, we can come closer uh, to this ideal scenario is here, if there is a professional translator, a professional translational research center is involved uh, with one main function to facilitate, to, to mediate between these two worlds, but also to be the oil in the motor here. And this, that's now uh, a lot of text, and if you're really interested, you can read this, uh, this paper. Uh, I would like to emphasize again, it has to be a true partnership, yeah? sharing everything, it has to be an active collaboration, not taking something away. And uh, here are the main reasons why I think that, that you need such a professional uh, translational research center. Uh, because this research center can work independently of both academic and industrial incentives. Yeah? So the, the investor is uh, of course also needed yeah? 
uh, but the investor should not dictate by when something has to be delivered or how things have to be moved along and so on. Um, this uh, mediator translator uh, also can then bring the two worlds together. Uh, trust and reliance is important and, and, and this uh, can be achieved by involving these professional uh, translational research centers. And, and there are more things about the, uh, project management and IP management and so on uh, because these are important questions and, but should not be the burden of the academics. So, and, and now I'm coming to the Lead Discovery Center, which in fact is a, a professional translation research center, so translating academic science into pharmaceutical application. And uh, the company was, it's a company, a GmbH, uh, was founded by the Max Planck Society, uh, in fact by Max Planck Innovation, which is the transfer organization of the Max Planck Society, but in, in, in reality it was the Max Planck Society saying, okay, uh, we want to have this uh, because they also then entered into a framework contract, which means that they reserved an annual budget to do project work. And before I uh, was introduced to this concept in 2008, and then I immediately said I will join, um, I was aware that, that in, in overall Europe, uh, people were talking about there has to be some translation, there has to be funding for translation. Uh, politicians, uh, uh, health uh, uh, insurance people, uh, scientists and so on. But if you see at the landscape that's existing, it's going very well, quite well in the UK. There is one additional center in Belgium, in Leuven, which has a very uh, nice history uh, from, from Eric de Klerk and, and others who just made the money uh, which is now invested and the LDC uh, founded by the Max Planck Society. So 20 years of talking but only very few say okay and then we really do something. So now we have uh, 60 employees. Um, we have this framework contact which is of course important and I will come later on that we also have additional uh, funding sources. Uh, we work on small molecules, uh, so we do not work on biologics because this gap is much more pronounced uh, for, for small molecules. We have uh, strict industry criteria because we would like to, or we, we intend to sell uh, the project, the, the, the products coming out of our research to industry and so this has to match and therefore it's important that most of our employees have industry experience because only then you can know what you have to uh, achieve that it's really matching and, and that the industry is, want to, is, is wanting to, to license or purchasing it. What we also do uh, and, and uh, Many people don't understand, so we are open for all indications. So we don't have a focus on a target class or in a specific indication because it's really the motivation, the prime mission to serve the whole academic, in principle, to serve the, the whole academic community. <coughs> Which of course is also then quite a stretch, uh, but this we can uh, do by our uh, network within the academic and industrial landscape. So and what we do uh, exactly is so we take up hypotheses on, on a new therapeutic mechanism uh, from academia, but not taking it away. So it's always then a collaboration. So the academic PIs, the group, has to contribute, is on board, until it's uh, uh, possible then uh, to have this proof of concept in a therapeutic animal model. And this, uh, this is then a, a, a time point in the, in the uh, value chain where industry is quite interested in taking, taking this up. This was also different 20 years or 15 years ago where industry was only licensing or, or purchasing um, projects that were already in, in, in clinical trials phase two or so. This has completely changed and this is uh, part of the structural change. And so 
What has to be considered, if this is now done in a professional way, this is also associated with costs. And so uh, for a typical project, if you really start with the target and want to end up here, on average, it's about 2 to 2.5 million euros. And what this should show is uh, what we also understand uh, under professional translation. So what we see quite regularly and uh, also when I'm reviewing scientific papers and so on, that uh, compounds are identified by screening or by other uh, methods and then they are put directly into animals without a pharmacokinetic study if they really hit the target or not. Uh, sometimes yeah, they are really injected or, or the, the animal is, is bathed in, in the compound, then there is a certain readout and hooray we are there almost in the almost on the market. In 99% of the cases uh, it's necessary that hit compounds, so the, the first biologically active compounds that are identified uh, modulating a target, they need optimization. And that's the, the, the hard core of what we are doing. Uh, so the compounds have to be optimized, uh, not only in terms of potency, it's much more important to have enough solubility, to have uh, cell penetration, uh, to have bioavailability and, and so on. And uh, if we then do the animal testing, uh, then that's much more reliable and then this opens the way uh, to go the next steps. And for this we need uh, different expertise and we have all the core competencies you need in early drug discovery in-house. So that's also important that we are not uh, depending on, on external uh, partners. So we do a lot of outsourcing but all the experiments, the design of the experiments are done internally and also the interpretation is done by our people. Um, so we have here uh, people in biochemistry, automation, screening. Uh, this is uh, pharmacology, so we don't do in vivo uh, study internally. So this we do with partners or, or via outsourcing to CROs. But as I said, the, the experiments are designed internally. We also do in vitro, so cellular ATME pharmacology uh, studies uh, routinely. Uh, we do bioanalytics also from, from uh, animal uh, studies. This is cell biology, testing the compounds on cells, functions, uh, also uh, identifying biomarkers and so on. And medicinal chemistry is doing then the optimization of the compounds so that they can be used in animal models, uh, that they can be made fit for testing and then further optimized uh, for the clinical testing. And as I mentioned, so 60 people, and we have at the moment 20 projects. So this you cannot do with 60 people. So we have outsourcing and many, many collaborations. And as I mentioned, we always want and have the academic PIs collaborating, contributing with actual work on the projects. And that's the business model and again a very important component. I mentioned already before this share fair and so on. So this indicates here uh, the identification of a target, of a hypothesis uh, to modulate the target and so on. And then it's coming to the lead discovery center. So that's our contribution here. But the academic partner stays on board, contributes up then to the commercialization. These are the different possibilities. So as you mentioned, also net spin-offs are, are possible or even to transfer a project to a biotech company. Um, we also have now uh, a transferred one project uh, to, to a patient association, for instance. Um, and commercialization in most of the cases, so if it's not with patient organizations and so on, means also that there are license payments uh, associated and uh, these result then in milestone and royalties and these are then again shared LDC but quite a big share goes to the academic partners and in our case most of the project the investor is the Max Planck Society so they get uh, uh, another big share here. So, um, how do you 
such targets. So that's this would be the the criteria here. Yeah. Um, there has to be an innovative aspect. So we would not do what uh, four companies uh, are already working on, or, or if there are already two companies in the clinic, so why should we work on, 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 on the next one? Uh, definitely a medical need and so on. So these are, of course, uh, according to your question, are more soft criteria. Uh, and the next one is then that we, that we believe that we can do this technically, yeah, so that it's technically feasible. Also, I would like to emphasize here uh, that we have invented new assays. So we have uh, done screening on a target, on a U3 uh, ubiquitin ligase, where there was no assay available, no precedence, but we established a very novel and robust assay for high throughput screening. So we would not shy away, but, but feasibility is something and also commercial, uh, commercial ability. So not the market potential, because I can uh, tell you several drugs where they made their market, yeah? where they, like cyclosporin, for instance. Yeah? Uh, before cyclosporin, there was no transplantation market. Yeah? Um, so, and then what is not so nice, uh, one uh, additional selection criterion is funding. Yeah. So we don't have capital, so we cannot really finance the project. So if it comes from the Max Planck Society and we have the funding, if it's coming from a university or from a different organization, we either have to apply for a grant application uh, or other things. So in principle, we are completely uh, open. Yeah. So, so that's also a nice thing from the Max Planck Society. So they established everything. They did the initial investment, but the Max Planck Society does not really fund university projects, so which is fair. So what fraction of the project in Max Planck gets a grant? So uh, from the, 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 the projects, that's, that's more difficult because we also have mixed projects, <laughs> but, but uh, from the um, from the, the invested money, I can tell it's about 65% uh, Max Planck money and the rest is grant industry and so on. So this tells you already a little bit about the... And just going back, what I would like to, to emphasize also is uh, the benefits for the academic partners. I mentioned already the revenues, so they, they get shares then also financially, uh, but there are many more factors. Uh, uh, I've listed here some. Uh, they get industrial know-how, consultancy, uh, access to infrastructure and so on. Uh, they get tool compounds enabling basic research and publications. Yeah. Um, and we have seen this, yeah. So, so, uh, and and I think which is also quite nice, uh, showing that that it's working, that uh, academic groups are coming back and again and again, yeah. So that uh, they say, okay, and we have now the next project. And this is a slide just to summarize, more or less. Uh, so far, I've more or less talking about the theory. Uh, about translation, and this should summarize that it's really working, uh, particular now uh, emphasizing uh, at the Lead Discovery Center. So in these uh, first seven years, because it also took some time until we really could start uh, with, with the first project, uh, we had eight lead nominations, and if you remember, so these are the, where we have this proof of concept in a whole animal, which is reliable and so on, patentable, we also have two approaches devalidated. We consider this also a success if something is clearly devalidated, if we can say the hypothesis was wrong. We have, out of these eight, we have three projects licensed and uh, three further projects are already uh, part of an industrial collaboration. Um, I would like to also emphasize on this here because uh, no one uh, believed when we 
when we started that this could be po uh, would be possible. We have uh, many early partnerships with industry under pre-negotiated terms already in, in this very early phase, which means uh, that, uh, for instance, that's publicly known. We have a collaboration with Merck Serono on a particular project. Uh, and uh, the pre-negotiated terms mean when we reach a certain milestone, then they will uh, internalize the project and this milestone and royalty payments will be triggered. And more now coming to, to science, uh, uh, we have first in class, this means unprecedented uh, compound series uh, against these targets here uh, with in vivo pharmacokinetic and uh, pharmacodynamic readout means the compounds uh, reach the target and modulating of the target uh, could be achieved. Um, and this is highlighted because I would like to show uh, a couple of slides here. Uh, I mentioned already earlier, uh, it's not only the, the success then to license something, uh, to sell something, uh, even novel assets we consider as success. And, and we have s established here several novel assets um, where there was no possibility to study uh, these targets before. Man lack too, there, there, there are many uh, SS and, and compounds out for the kinase, but not for the GTPAs. This net formation is uh, neutrophil extracellular traps. So neutrophil uh, spill out their chromatin on, on certain stimuli. That's uh, important in bacterial infection, but also in autoimmune diseases. And this was a high content screen using primary human neutrophils. Yeah? So in the morning there was blood drawn from volunteers and at the end of the day we had the screening results and in total it took uh, um, 40 weeks until we had screened our library. So this is not possible in a biotech environment because the investor would tell you, are you yeah, crazy what you're doing? That's also important protein-protein interaction stabilizers, so not inhibitors and so on. And that's now this uh, scientific uh, case study, you may argue kinases, uh, cycling dependent kinases, there are already drugs on the market. So what's so new? What is really new is that we have identified the first mono selective, where our compounds really hit with very high specificity, very high selectivity, only either this or this kinase. And uh, most of the kinase inhibitors that are currently used in therapies uh, hit many or multiple kinases. Uh, and there was an additional challenge at the beginning uh, because there is uh, uh, amantidine known from, from the Knollen blätter pilz as a very toxic substance. And uh, this substance uh, uh, inhibits uh, RNA polymerase II. So it's very toxic. And so the question was, uh, CDK9 and CDK7 are also regulating uh, general transcription. So is this then a toxic principle if you have ident uh, identified inhibitors? And uh, is it if, you, if, if both of these uh, regulate the general transcription and regulate uh, RNA pol 2 polymerase 2 so is this then a redundant system or whatsoever? So this was the challenge and what I'm would like to, to add here is that uh, industry has spent billions of whatever currency and 20 years on identifying uh, CDK inhibitors and only recently there was the huge breakthrough uh, with this uh, uh, dual CDK4-6 inhibitors in, in the clinic from, from uh, Pfizer, GSK and, and Novartis and we have monospecific inhibitors here. So 20 years of research and we could uh, 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 identify these inhibitors and, and that's a selectivity profile now only among the family of targets and you see already how selective uh, these compounds are. Yeah? And I don't have a slide with me but believe me that the whole uh, that this uh, enormous fantastic selectivity is also um, within the 
at least currently testing kinase uh, genome available. So we have these highly selective things. Uh, then we did cellular tests. So these are several cell lines. Yeah. And uh, in yellow, there are the IC50 values of a potent monospecific CDK9 inhibitor. And in blue, uh, the IC50s uh, of a CDK7 inhibitor. Again, very monospecific. And so this answered two questions. The, the first one, these inhibitors are not generally toxic because then you would see just a flat line here somewhere that you have uh, low IC50 values against all the cell lines. And you see a very distinct profile for CDK9 versus the CDK7 inhibitor. So it's not a redundant system. So you can use both inhibitors specifically, again, for specific uh, indications. And that's what we are currently exploring, CDK9 with Bayer. So this project was uh, outsourced. And that's now a slide from, from uh, Bayer. They presented this uh, at the AACR in 2015, uh, where they described our compound here as in vivo properties, showing very nice uh, tumor, even regression here. So that's an AML tumor. And uh, this showing that, that uh, uh, Bayer was very uh, happy with, with the in-licensing and the compound is currently in uh, phase one, in, in, in already the third phase one trial, which is also very posit positive. Uh, and uh, the phase two uh, probably will start uh, this year. So just to sum up, I mentioned already several times we have identified the first monoselective ATP competitive CDK inhibitors. Uh, the principle is not toxic. We see a difference between uh, seven and nine and so on um, and have partnered both of these projects licensed, which means that we already received some, some money for this and the academic collaborators as well. So that's just uh, uh, another overview that, that we have uh, partnerships with other companies ongoing. And uh, it's also nice to see that it's, it's growing more and more. Uh, in the very early days, we had to approach uh, the, the industrial uh, people. In the meantime, they come to us and ask if they can collaborate with us. So quite a nice success story. And this is more than on the technological side. Here we have a, a joint venture, a daughter company established where we can do also high content screening, where we can do radiometric screening, where we have uh, excellent infrastructure that's in Constance. And uh, this is together with CD3. I mentioned this is uh, the, the second continental uh, European drug, uh, professional drug uh, uh, translational research center. And with Ax Axam, Axam is a, a, a screening CEO. And we are also expanding in, in the um, academic collaborations. And these are not collaborations, these are funding. Yeah? So the University of Tromsø is funding a project, is financing a project. The Helmholtz uh, Association is financing two projects and so on. And uh, this is a, a Korean institute and they also will finance uh, a project with us. That's just a summary. So we see us as a kind of wet tech transfer. We are certainly not a CEO, not a biotech. So we have a very different uh, culture and so on. And yeah, so my vision, as I mentioned before, is bringing the strengths together, solving problems together. And these are our main uh, partners uh, we have at the moment. And at the end, I would like to thank our people because uh, they do the work. They produce the excellent results, which we then uh, can sell to the industry. Yeah, and finally, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them.